Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's episode of Learn Live UAE. We've got really, really great topical um, discussion this evening with two fantastic educators. Um, so our, our topic this evening is what are schools going to look like post-COVID? It's a really, really tricky topic to navigate, I feel, this evening because we're all in such different circumstances and you know, different schools have different contexts and none of us quite know um, how we're going to um, look essentially once we get back to school in September. Hopefully, I think it's fair to say that we're all really keen for both staff to be in school as well as students. So really, really excited to um, welcome our two guests onto the show this evening. Um, before we kind of get going, please remember that you are more than welcome to um, post your comments in, I think it's on that side of the screen, into the YouTube live chat, and I can bring those comments up. Um, and our guests can answer any questions if you've got or if you would just like to reinforce anything that either of them have said. Um, so please do feel free to tune in. Um, we've got one comment straight away, um, and that's from my co-host, Mark. He says, good luck on the show tonight, everyone. Sorry I cannot make it to be with you. Um, one of the joys of having co-hosts um, is in the instance where something comes up, um, there's always one of us here to, um, to hold the stand, as it were. So tonight, um, it's my privilege um, to, to host um, our two guests this evening. So our first guest this evening is uh, Natasha Hilton. Um, she's based in the Middle East. She's assistant head at um, the British School of Muscat. So our second guest from that particular school in this series of, of uh, shows. She's heavily involved with the TES Global Institute on their advisory board. She's also um, one of the women-ed leaders for the region. Um, and you can find her on uh, Twitter. Uh, and her handle is um, at Natasha Hilton 3. Our second guest this evening is Liz Free. She was a um, founder of um, at BSN TLA, and we'll find out a little bit more about that later on. She's also a global board member for the TES Institute. She's a strategic lead for Women Ed. It's great to see uh, the postnomials FCCT there. That's a fellow of the Chartered College of Teaching. Um, also happened to be involved with the Chartered College of Teaching, as is Natasha, actually, come to think of it. So, a couple more questions possibly later on about um, how you can get involved in the Chartered College um, from an international perspective. Um, Liz is on Twitter as at Liz am free. Um, so please do engage um, with them on social media. Um, so I guess a couple of sort of reflections from the Middle East then. Um, we had a, a meeting today as, as SLT about what the start of next year might look like. And having spoken within my own school context and then to other leaders in the region, everyone's really, really kind of on the edge of their seat to find out what, what's actually going to happen. I know from a, um, a UAE perspective, we're waiting on some directives from um, the Ministry of Education. So I'm really, really keen to hear um, what's going on in other areas of the region. Natasha currently works in Oman, but is moving to Qatar. Um, so looking forward to hearing um, what she's got to say um, from that perspective. And then Liz is, is currently in the Netherlands, but is moving to, uh, my memory must serve me right here, she's moving to um, near Liechtenstein, Switzerland. Um, so really, really looking forward to find out what's going on um, kind of in Central Europe and what lessons we can learn from that this evening. So without further ado, um, I think it's time to invite in our first guest. So um, Natasha, hello, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Really good, thank you. Very good indeed. Um, for those of the, you know our viewers that, that are watching, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your role um, and your experience of, of working in the Middle East? Yeah, so um, I am currently one of the assistant heads at the British School Muscat. Um, I've been in the Middle East for six years. So uh, the British School Muscat was the first um, hosting, I suppose, internationally I had. I came directly from the UK. I was in um, inner city London schools. Um, and, and this year I will be taking up a headship at Parkhouse English School in Qatar. Um, so continuing the international journey, continuing the uh, journey in the Middle East and obviously moving over to Qatar. Um, I think from my perspective, I've, I've been lucky, I've been given lots of opportunities, I've 
you know, I've become part of the test and advisory board, like you've said, I'm part of women's ed. Um, I've been doing work with the Trust College, like you've mentioned as well. So kind of, I suppose, putting putting my fingers in all pies. Um, and just, I suppose, from my perspective, it's about keeping up to date with what's going on um, in, in, um, in education, but also from an international perspective as well and making sure we're kind of at the forefront of things. So, yeah, that's a summary. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's great to to hear that you you are invested and interested in all those sort of different areas within education and and look to share that um, within your kind of local context as well as a, a wider picture um, within education. What um, this part of the world then, um, the Middle East? Um, what kind of events go on for Women Ed? Could you just sort of elaborate um, on? How people connect through that that network yeah so that that is definitely um everything's via twitter um so twitter is kind of our our, <laughs> our golden jewel um in terms of promoting anything so for the middle east it's um women ed m or women ed mena you'll find it in my uh, bio as well um and actually so we kind of only really started it up last year um, and we have some events going on over the next couple of weeks, and then there'll be two weekly, um, so bi-weekly events going on as of the 1st of July, actually. So if you look at my Twitter handle and just keep updates with that, I'll be sending out all of the links through that as well when we're having them. So our first one in the next couple of weeks is just an English version of what Women Ed is about, looking at 10% braver. Uh, two weeks ago, we had an Arabic version as well. Um, so what we're trying to do is is, is involve the local communities um, and just women in education in all of the schools in the region as well. And that's um, that's been really positive so far. We've had some really fantastic feedback. And so, yeah, keep keep looking at that every two weeks. Um, what we'll do at the end of the show is um, we'll um, stick in that information, if you could share that with us, Natasha, and we'll fantastic. put it into the show but it's really really easy for people to to access that um i just want to know if everything's run through twitter then is that they're going to be are you going to broadcast like a webinar like this or are you so going to basically host everything so the actual events will be sent through event right because all of the women at events mm -hmm. are sent through event right um, and then there'll be links through there so yeah they're, they're webinars going through event right but all links will be on twitter uh, similar to Okay, fantastic. Um, and you, you mentioned, well, I've, I've mentioned as well that you're moving across to Qatar. Um, how do you feel on a sort of personal note moving mid-pandemic? Yeah, um, excited and scared at the same time, maybe. Um, yeah, um, excitement because obviously it's fresh, it's new. I'm really excited to make the move with the family and, and be joining a really exciting school at a really exciting stage um, um, in, in their journey. Um, I have amazing staff that I'm going to be working with there. I've met everybody. I've already done parent meetings. So all of that excitement of, you know, kind of when you're, you know, when you've got your class and every year, it's always really exciting to get your new class and buy new pens and put stickers <laughs> on your books. And it seems really pathetic because it's so like a really immature thing to feel, but that's, that's the excitement you get every year as a teacher, isn't it? You've got new children coming through. And so that's, that's definitely how I feel. Um, about about joining my new school as well and it's really sad to be leaving um, BSM because I've been here for six years and it's been amazing I've got amazing colleagues it's an amazing school great children um, yeah so from from one journey to another but yeah the, the scared bit and the the bit of the the you know going through a pandemic is do you know what I just see it as an extra layer of challenge that if you can get through this you can pretty much get through most things yeah, I agree with you on that. And I think it's, you know, you, you, you often your best learning experiences are when you do step out of your comfort zone and you challenge yourself to do something new in a completely different context. And I'm sure that you've picked up a vast array of skills that you can transfer in your uh, your new school in uh, in Qatar from BSN. I've heard lots of good stuff about BSN. We obviously had Matt, who's um, head of science on the show a couple of weeks back, yeah. looking at um, cognitive science. And um, Kai, the principal, is obviously, um, he's constantly blogging and, and doing all sorts of things on social media. So, um, you know, spreading the name uh, throughout the region and, and the globe. Yeah. Um, so without further ado then, should we, um, I'm conscious of time because we're nearly at, at yes. 10 past. Should we jump into your presentation? Yeah, so my presentation is relatively short and I just want to put a caveat on, this is kind of an overall, I'm thinking about moving to Qatar right, right now, not necessarily what's been happening um, at BSM, but also I am considering what's happening at BSM and 
and kind of putting all of these things together in terms of preparation for when um, we're moving to Qatar. Um, and yeah, what what things are going to look like in September effectively, um, <laughs> which is again the unknown in, in all fairness. But we're gonna we're gonna muddle through and, and yeah, and, and people can chime in however they want. Um, yeah. can you see my screen? Sure, I'll add your screen now if you jump in. Please do, everybody, send in your questions via YouTube Live. Okay, and then once Natasha's done her presentation, um, we can uh, ask her some questions. Perfect. Can you see me and the screen or just the screen? Yep, can see you and the screen. Perfect, just checking. Looks like you see the screen. Okay, um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of um, sat down this afternoon and had a really good think about what things are going to look like in schools um post COVID-19 and, and will I say it's post COVID-19 no it's most probably going to linger on for a, for a while but we're, we're in the unknown and and you know different to to definitely the UK and I'm hoping to hear more about what's going on in the rest of Europe from Liz but we are waiting on guidance from the Ministry of Education and, and that's the same for Qatar and that's the same for where I am in Oman as well at the moment so we are in an unknown realm of what is it going to look like? And I suppose every school at the moment and, and where I am, we're looking at three, three scenarios. Are we fully open? Are we partially, partially open with some online going on? Or are we fully online when we, um, when we start in August? Um, and well, August um, for here and, and September for Qatar. Um, we don't know. Um, and so all of the great schools and, and in terms of colleagues in the Middle East that I'm speaking to are preparing for all of those all of those scenarios. Um, and that's all we can do at the moment because we're really in that unknown realm. Um, but what we are all doing is thinking about what our priorities are and what are those priorities. Um, you know, if I'm honest and if I'm real, I would say that, you know, there are so many obstacles that we face during this time it's not only um the you know the going through through covid and the, and the safety aspects of that and being healthy but it's dealing with parents dealing with children dealing with the well-being of everyone and that's been i would say the most difficult part of this whole process and still going to be the most challenging part of the process when we come back in august um, what would I say are the key things that we're all thinking about for August? Well, regardless of whether we are in fully or partially or are still at home, it's going to be about the health and safety aspect. And every school has something different. There are, are we going to have temperature checks as children are walking through the doors? Are we going to have some children in and some children are not? How do you prioritise that? Is it going to be that we've got exam years in because they've seen as a priority, but guaranteed you'll have parents saying, well, actually, what about my children? My children's education is just as important. And that is true. So how do you sit down as an SLT and start to manoeuvre that and have conversations about that? Is it that you'll have some children, some classes in a couple of days a week, other classes in a couple of days a week? Do you split classes? Um, when we're talking about social distancing, are you having half a class in, half a class not in? They are all questions that are flying around all schools at the moment. And we are all having to think of what we're going to do to best meet the needs of our children um, and our parents and our staff in our schools. And that's really difficult. Um, like I said, I think that the, the top priority for all of us is the safety aspect. Um, what are we doing if we're finding children that have a temperature? Are we temperature checking? That's the first question. Um, you know, at the moment we've got um, BSM are putting infrared cameras in and that will automatically detect if children um, have a temperature. Some schools stand in at gates and are going to be temperature checking children as they're coming through to schools. Um, uh, at the moment in Oman, we have to wear masks. So that's not optional in comparison to um, other places in the world. Are we wearing gloves? Are we wearing gloves? Do we know how to use gloves? Do we not know how to use gloves? Um, and then there's also the question of parents at the moment. They are struggling. Many parents are struggling at home with their children um, in terms of, you know, um, keeping them occupied, keeping them on task. And actually, um, I think it's, it's taken for granted a lot that how much we, we do as educators in this last bit of the, the summer term, especially in the Middle East, where we've got, you know, 40 pumps going up to 50 degree heat. We've got children inside 
all day and they can't go out at break time um, and people are starting to see how hard it is for us to to, to cope with children in these situations and, and then being at home at the moment and not having all of that social aspect um, is a big deal. So, you know, where do, where do our priorities lie? I don't know, what are we focusing on? So from my perspective, it's about the health and safety aspect. Um, obviously, especially if we're in school or if we're partial. If we're online, you know, those things are still happening in school. Um, luckily, internationally, you always have someone that's focused on health and safety. Generally, you've got nurses in school, etc. So that is really helpful. Um, but I would say for me, um, the well-being element is going to be key. That is going to be the thing that is the biggest because everybody in every school has experienced something differently whether they have had personalized calls from principals checking that they're okay, whether they haven't had that, whether they've had teachers calling them, whether they've had a yearly touching base, and that's just in relation to staff. Then it's the, well, what's been put in place for children? Are we, you know, um, speaking to them regularly? Are they getting feedback every day? Are, do we know what's going on, how they're feeling? Are we touching base? Um, and schools are going to look very different when we come back. Um, in, in September and even if we are fully online and we're looking at October, November, whatever it might be, um, when those children do come back into school, there is going to need to be a huge focus, more so than any other year that we've had. You know, we always do a general PSHE getting to know your class in the beginning of the year, but actually we really need to have a focus on how these children are feeling, but there is also a key focus on how staff are feeling. From a, from a leadership perspective, that is going to be one of my top priorities. People would have normally have had the summer to recover. And this year, it's highly likely that many people will not have that um, internationally. Many people will be staying in the country, which means generally people are going to be working, they're going to be in contact, and just as much as they may try to have that summer, they are unlikely to have it. And, and they're not going to have it in the way that they would have, where they would have seen family. Um, internationally educators yes you have some families but you've got a lot of single people as well single people that are not going to see families um, and as a leader we need to be really conscious of keeping on top of how people are feeling and are they okay especially when we get back into school because they are likely to be tired from having a year having not very much of a summer break and then coming into another highly stressful unusual situation um, when we are fully in school. So well-being for me is going to be a top priority and I would say most probably for most schools. And then the uh, question is, um, what are we doing in terms of providing an education for our children? Um, live or not to live has been the big massive question. Um, it has been a, a talk of the town for everyone. Um, whether some schools are have been going live, haven't been going live, have just started trialing going live, um, and you know um, at uh, BSM and at Park House, you know we have done live lessons, and those are now being re reviewed and reflected upon, and and you know because we couldn't go straight away because um, I'm sure you would have seen loads of Kai's tweets, which were um, and and the same for John Smith, my principal at, at Park House. Is it safe? What are the safeguarding implications? And lots of things have had to be put in place in order to prepare for that. So, fantastically, those things have now been put in place. At the moment, it's about review and reflection, speaking to staff, speaking to parents, speaking to children about how those live sessions have gone um, and what is the impact of those live sessions. Have they worked? Has it had an impact on our children? If it has and it's positive and everything seems to be going in the right direction, then do we then continue that when we come back in August, September, October, or wherever we're, we, you know, if, if we're still online? Um, and, and, and they're questions that we still need answers to, to be fair, and we're not going to know them until we've had that review process. Um, and then I think the last thing really is um, I'm forever the optimist and I try not to keep things. Um, negative and obviously this has been a really challenging time for everyone um, and we can continue to be oh you know well it's, it's really hard and it's hard work and absolutely it is I have never seen teachers work so hard um, you know it, it 
is a challenge. People have turned around a whole way of teaching over weekends. And, you know, we are now at a nice part where we have been doing it. It's not been the nicest experience because actually most people that go into education are want to be in school with children. Um, and that's why we've gone into education because we want that contact, we want that face to face. And I'm sure that everyone will look at it and say, oh my goodness, you know, anything that we took for granted before, we will appreciate being in school, being with colleagues and being with children in, in one place. Um, and, and all of the negatives surrounding um, COVID and the health and safety aspects, which will continue, unfortunately, in the, in the new year, we will be thinking about the masks and distancing and, and how often we can be around people and, you know, are people sick? And if they are sick, taking it much more seriously than we have been before, you know, um, in terms of, you know, well, you know, if someone's got a sore throat, it's not just you can sit through a lesson, right, you need to be home now and you need to be checking yourself. Um, and yeah, we need to try now to start thinking about the positives. What positives have we got out of this? Well, actually, I think there are loads. Um, we have completely changed and looked at another way of teaching. Um, and actually, that, that's a real positive that, you know, the rain days that we had or, or whatever, we could actually do something about those now. Um, meetings that I've been having at my new school where um, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to meet every every single teacher face to face. I wouldn't have been able to meet some of the parents that work because they're working into the evening. And actually, I've been able to do that now. I've been able to have these conversations late in an evening and knowing that people are going to be able to access them. Um, parents that potentially weren't able to make meetings, we can have these sessions now. Um, you know, if children are on sick long term for whatever reason, we can provide some sort of education for them now. Um, which maybe we won't be able to do before. So, you know, there are lots of negatives, lots of but lots of positives as, as well that have come through this. Um, and when we come back in August, like I said, we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but from an international perspective, we are always working super hard and always prepared, always prepared for for any um, of of our scenarios. Um, and we work with amazing colleagues that have had experiences all over the world. And, and actually, that is an absolute benefit um, because everyone has fantastic ideas and we're constantly sharing those ideas. So, so yes, so no solid answers, but lots of ideas. <laughs> There's great. There's lots of um, lots of reflective points there to think about. What really sort of resonated um, with me there when you were, was was really focus on well-being. I think that's that's at the forefront of everyone's mind now. And I really do hope that in this kind of new normal, not just leaders but teachers and parents and students all um, really concentrate on that now and actually realise the importance of it. Not just yeah. within education, but within every sector that's that's Absolutely. out there. Quite often, it's one of those one of those sort of cyclical things that comes in and out again. But it should be at the forefront at all times. Yeah. Um, a question for you then, um, from either school perspective, is is obviously you know we we I think we've just finished week fourteen. Am I right in thinking that of of kind I of online? I can't even keep up. I'm literally like I don't yeah. really know. It feels like forever. It's all blended into one, hasn't it? I mean, so. You know, we've been rigorously looking after students and, and really mindful of not overloading them during this, providing that support network, communicating with parents as much as we can. And, you know, we're, we're I think, you do you finish this week or next week? I think, anyway, we're, yeah, we're, we're a week or two from finishing. And, you know, we're at a point now where staff just need to switch off and they really need to not be at their laptop. So how do we make sure we get the right balance in schools? Because families are still going to need some support. Yeah. Not just as simple as just summer's here, turn everything off. So what sorts of things can schools do throughout that period to help support families? Yeah, so I think there's lots of, I think it's really difficult for families. And I get the same questions all the time. What can I do to occupy my children, et cetera? Um, and I'm the parent as well. I have a nine-year-old. Um, and a two-year-old at home, my 17-year-old's um, back in London. But th these are the things that we're providing. So at BSM, we're creating like booklets and, and um, websites and activities and videos now prior to shutting down and saying, look, 
these are the things that you, you can do with your children to help keep them occupied because they are inside and they are frustrated and they don't have the social aspects. Um, you know, they, they can have Zooms, like we've had lots of Zoom parties and things that the children have been involved in um, yeah. from, a, from a personal perspective, my son's been involved in as well. Um, and we're keeping things open so that there is still work, going. So there's work that children haven't quite completed. We're keeping things open for them to still complete it over the summer holidays. Because normally you'd be saying, look, shut up, put, shut up, put your books down, kids. But actually, at the moment, you need to give them an option of being able to do something because we're still in lockdown. Our children are still not outside. And, you know, how much screen time and computers and TV can you occupy them with? And mm -hmm. it's getting hot now. So how much can you actually yeah. even get to go to a pool or a beach or whatever it, whatever it is? We're in a really different situation to the UK. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we might eventually it might be lockdowns over and we can get outside. But actually, it's then 50 degrees. You can't go outside for very long. Yeah. Or you're outside <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning for sunrise because that's the only time they can get outside. And, um, and it's a really difficult situation. And everyone's handling it really differently. And, and I think that we do need to support parents we do need to support them in terms of providing um them with things for their children but um you know for me as a leader of the school i i also need to really consider how staff are feeling right now and and you know if, if we're completely honest with ourselves they have been the people that have been thrown in the deep end they've had a weekend to turn things around they have been slogging this whole time there was no half term there was no break um, and that goes for the UK as well, you know, and and they have been doing a, a completely different job than what they signed up for effectively. You know, they've had to manoeuvre around technology, manoeuvre around communicating with parents and children and, and SLT and all of the other stuff. You know, they still have to assess. They still have to do all of this other stuff that they would have been doing in a normal day. Plus making a video and uh, videos for, for sessions and people can turn around and say, oh, yeah, it's a three minute video. A three minute video takes five hours to create. You know, it's not, you know, people don't understand how long it takes, and especially for somebody that may not be as au fait with technology. We're in schools and we're on whiteboards and computers all of the time, but this is a very different way of working, and we need to be really considerate of that. And like I've said, you know, internationally, you know, we are without our families. This is not that we're at home and you've got nannies up the road, you know, our, our grandparents or our parents that are there to look after children. Or some people, like I've said, are single and are now not going to be able to get home to family. They're not going to be able to get home to parents and cousins and all of the normal stuff that they would do. They lost that at Easter as well. So they are missing home. They're homesick. And that's a, a massive, massive thing. Um, and we really need to think about that and touch base with people and see if people are OK. Um, and, and as 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 SLT and as leadership, we need to be doing that. We need to be keeping an eye on people over this holiday because um, because it's a really unusual time, and they need they need yeah. that communication. Yeah, that, I, I really agree with you on that one. And it's it's tough, isn't it, as a leader, because you just want to switch off as well. But actually, focusing on on staff and making sure that we do just still check in with them. You know, at least once a week is a is a massively important um, process, I think, to go through to ensure. And those phone calls are appreciated, you know. <laughs> yeah, Just to, right. you're right, hi, you know, you people appreciate them, you know, and and it does give you a boost to have a conversation with somebody. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's one of those things as well, isn't it? From a sort of leadership point of view, that it 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 shows authenticity, it adds buy-in, it makes people feel valued, they know that they're cared for and appreciated yeah. within that school community. And I think, yeah. you know, that little two, three minute phone call can add, you know, such a um such an impact on that person that it's it's really, really important. We've had a, yeah. a comment come in here from Krishna saying the editing of videos takes a very long time, not to mention being conscious of you know your appearance and making sure that you're you're in a professional situation and yeah. you know that's that's a great point thank you krishna um i'm mindful of the time natasha we're approaching halfway and um just want to um invite liz in for a little chat i've still got a few more questions but um I'm conscious of the time so let's let's invite liz to the conversation hi liz hi how are you very good, thank you. Um, any reflections on, on what Natasha and I have discussed so far? Yeah, it's really interesting because we are back. 
mm. uh, we're now um, our schools physically went back. Although, of course, like uh, you've been describing, we've been operating all the way through, and we shouldn't forget that. You know, when schools are physically open, we've been open the whole time. Um, but the actual physical locations uh, started to open in mid-May. Um, on a phased return initially, um, following Dutch guidance. By the way, I'm from the Netherlands, hurrah, hurrah. Um, or at the moment, I'm not from the Netherlands, I live in the Netherlands, um, <laughs> obviously with this accent. And so um, we, yeah, so our primary schools went back first and they went back on phased return. And so they did alternate days to split the numbers of students so we could main the, maintain the 1.5 meter social distancing, uh, which is an interesting uh, endeavor in its own right. Um, but we achieved it. All the things that you were talking about, are we gonna do this? Are we gonna do that? What about gloves? All those conversations um, seem, you know, they're things that perhaps we haven't had to consider in that way before. And a huge amount of time and energy goes into understanding the local guidance the um, local regulations, the global best practice, and then making the decision about what you're going to do as a school. And we, we went through all of that, and now we are, um, we're doing it. And it's, it's really interesting. So we have, um, in terms of our primary schools, we have five schools. In terms of our primary schools, uh, we initially had three groups, group A, group B, group C. And group A and B were the alternate days. So all the families knew, everybody knew um, what that would be. And we split the classes down the middle um, and made sure that siblings were on the same day. Um, a little thing, but a pretty important thing for our families. And then we had group C, which continued to be um, homeschooled. So we continue to provide um, the online provision for the, that group as well. And that, I think, was the most challenging time when we were doing the dual of doing home learning and face to face. Um, we're now um, all of our schools are back, including our senior schools, um, although obviously um, our, it's affected our year 11 and 13. Um, but the, the rest of the schools are back and we're now um, almost 100 percent attendance. We're slightly under 100 percent attendance across our schools and also across our staff. Good. That's great to hear. Um, was that that kind of phased plan, obviously informed by by kind of government directives in where you are, or yeah, had you kind of planned for all eventualities like like Natasha? Oh yes, we had plan A, B, C, D, E, F. What about this? <laughs> that yeah. uh, it was I can't even um, and obviously I, um, as the director of the International Leadership Academy I'm, I'm responsible for the learning and development and school improvement side our head teachers were in um, you know they're in like the war room you know they were sat there for days yeah. on end um, looking at all different scenarios what is possible what isn't and we were given guidance from the Dutch government which gave the principles that you had to work under so things like you had to maintain the 1.5 meter um, social distancing yeah. uh, if students um, had a temperature then they had to self-isolate for 14 days with their families and so there were particular guidance however the how you then enacted that on your campus was down to your campus because of course all of our schools are different um, whether you're looking at um, state-funded schools private schools state-funded international private international whatever it might be you know all of those schools um, still had the same um, uh, basic criteria that they had to work to but then they had to put it into practice in a way that made sense to them so we couldn't contravene those guidelines um, but we had to uh, determine how it would work so some schools for example did half days split um, whereas we went for the full day and alternate days because of the transport of course because we have no public transport that we can use with our students and we weren't able to offer our school buses either which is a whole um, quite an epic um, uh, complexity to add into the mix as well although at least we can cycle we don't have 50 degrees heat I was just <laughs> sat here running myself earlier at 24 degrees I'm like, oh my goodness it's so hot <laughs> Um, so, so I think it's what I what I would say along this journey is that you are always like Natasha was saying you want to do the best for the students in your care and then making sure that you're communicating that with your parents all the way because this is hard you know I think we were I can't remember how many weeks I think we were around 10 weeks um, in lockdown and we're still you know there are still restrictions um, uh, uh, in the Netherlands and so you're absolutely right our teachers couldn't get um, home wherever home might be in the half term or Easter and it's taking a real toll uh, you know I see um, some teachers you know we're keeping very close to everyone I think the point of just making a phone call is such a little thing um, but staying connected both professionally and personally is absolutely critical <clears throat> I don't think we've even begun to, to um, 
even con um, conceptualize what the real impact that this will be on both our students, our families and our teachers. That's a, a real sort of sticking point there really, isn't it? That although it feels like we've been in the process for a really long time, actually we're, we're still kind of at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the longevity of what could happen, which is quite a hard thing to, it's a quite a hard thing to swallow really, isn't it? When you feel like you've made such advancements both in terms of you know your schooling, how you've approached teaching and learning, um, taking care of all the staff, the parents, everybody within your your kind of school community, and you know we've still got probably quite a long way to go. Do you have any other sort of top tips, um, Liz, aside from you know real clarity of communication with with the school community, having gone through that phased return that schools could learn from? I think pace. Pace is, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not normal life. And so when we're looking at our, I mean, I've been reading, reading a lot about um, uh, curriculum catch up, you know, how are we going to get through the curriculum? What are, you know, what are the implications? We've got to drive this, you know, we can't waste our summer holidays. You know, we've, we've got to be uh, making sure these students catch up. And I've heard that right across the board, whether you're in high performing uh, private international schools or you're in high performing states, it doesn't really matter. There's real concern, particularly in our um, upcoming examination years. And what I would say is that you've got to focus on the things that will make the biggest difference. You, you, our students' capacity um, to learn and our teachers' capacity to be able to teach is different to what it would normally be. And so you can't do the same old saying. And so looking at your curriculum plans, looking at what you intended to cover, and then looking at what you need to cover and how you do that. Um, and I think it, it's interesting, we were um, uh, thinking about the idea of mentoring, coaching, and what's the role of that going forwards. Uh, I think it's having real clarity, which we should be doing anyway, but it's really bringing it to the fore around what needs to be learnt and what skills do we need to develop and how can we optimise both ideally at the same time so that we can be really efficient in how um, our students are able to learn so that they can optimise um, the, the outcomes, particularly in those examination years. I think it's, like I said, I don't think we've even begun to, to, to comprehend or to be able to plan for that yet. Um, although there's lots of discussions around that. So I would say, don't assume that you can cram everything in that you would normally. And don't assume that those students that have been homeschooled, that they have, because they've an activity has been set, or they may or may not have engaged with it, that they've understood, um, and that they're really grounded and um, have mastery in that particular concept. Because what I think with what I'm experiencing as a parent myself, I've got a seven and a nine year old, uh, is that the the way they're learning, they're learning in a different way and they're learning different things. You know, my children know how to make pancakes, which is marvelous uh, for the waistline. Uh, but there's, you know, there's other areas where the work, you know, will have been delivered and copious amounts. I mean, I know my own children haven't got through, but they've probably done about 70% of what's actually been said. And so those are going to have real implications when we get to um, a full return to school. And I think that senior leaders and leaders at every level actually and teachers need to be confident in saying what they're going to do but also what they're not going to do and that is okay. Um, one, one sort of final question, yeah I completely agree with you on that, one final question before we delve into your, um, your presentation um, and one sort of reflection, I watched a, a really good talk the other day by Mary Meyer on the Research Ed Home um, YouTube channel and she was essentially you know reflecting on the same thing saying that you know the new normal pace is, is probably of the most importance and and when you really need to sort of strip everything back and focus on what is actually essential and how we get from A to B rather than overloading everybody. Um, with your kind of um, professional development hat on as well as, as sort of leadership hat on this goes to both of you how do schools get the balance with technology right then? You know, it's, it's really difficult and there is no right answer necessarily to that question but um, any thoughts on that? Um, I'd have to say do you know what we we've been really good here in terms of we had some real drivers because it was their thing and they were into it and mm. and and actually um, there was a, there was a member of staff that, that was really really dri driving something and people were kind of like oh yeah and then obviously this all happened and it was like, oh my gosh, we need her. And she became like the oracle of, yeah. um, of, of our online learning actually. And, and 
And it was really nice, actually, because she'd been going, please listen to me. And then it was like, oh, actually, I really, yeah. Um, and so actually what it's meant for us is that we have had some people able to really shine during this period and actually have them have, have then been able to go, well, look, I, I've been doing this and I've been doing this. And this has been stuff that they've just been doing their own CPD or their own bits and pieces at home. And that's been absolutely amazing. It's, you know, all of these skill sets that you didn't even know people had have come to light, which has been fantastic. Um, and actually, um, it's meant that there's been a real community feel because you do have all of these Zooms and all of these conversations where people are like, oh, I'll show you how to do that. And I'll go through that with you, which you wouldn't necessarily, because you may have had a, a planned CPD session or whatever it might be. When people are needing it now, they're asking for it and they're getting it, which has been amazing. Um, so from my perspective, actually, we, we've seen a very different um, look on how CPD happened especially in relation to technology um it has been really scary for others though and, and that's been where other people have stepped in and and, and stroked people's backs and, and and said look i'll help you here or i can support you here mm -hmm. so that sense of community has been really fantastic during this time as well in relation to cpd and how people have uh, developed liz how, how's it been for you I'd say it's the same. It's, you know, some people have been able to thrive in this environment. Some people, if you mention Zoom, you know, or Microsoft Teams, they'll just fall off a chair. They're just like, I yeah. can't do this anymore. So I, I think what the upskilling that has happened will stand us in, stand us in really good stead for the future. The key is not to lose it is to just think, oh, it's it's gone now, so we go back to normal. Because it it, it isn't, our, our students' experience of learning has been different. And so I, I think it's an opportunity to really think different. I mean, we're already having discussions about our parent meetings. You know, how do we engage with parents? We've learned a lot through this process. The way we communicate, the expectations of contact um, and parent consultations, you know, so we're, we're going online with all of those um, for the first time. And, and so I think, yeah, I, th I think there's loads of opportunities. And I think from a CPD pers perspective, I think that there's been a real strength in harnessing the potential of the staff that you already have. I think we also have to be, be mindful that for some, um, this this will be a, you know, a period of time that they just don't ever want to touch a laptop again. You know, they, they never want to, to see all of that. And I think we will get a little bit of an adverse reaction um, over time, which would be perfectly normal. Uh, but I think then it's about, again, making deliberate choices about when are we going to use the technologies that we've now become au fait with to really enhance the work we do as opposed to being in kind of critical incident mode. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's about, you know, putting pedagogy first really again, isn't it? And, and sort of coming back to that, it's not the additional bolt on that saves everything actually. It's, it's just a supportive tool that can enhance teaching and learning. Um, conscious of time, Liz, do you want to um, dive into your presentation? Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's go. We'll have time for a discussion at the end. Okay. Oh, well, I've got, to, I've got to share my screen. That would be wise, wouldn't it? Share your screen, yeah, and then I can uh, <laughs> add it to the stream. There we are. I'm just coming in now. Please do, just while we're waiting, send in any questions or any reflections, um, and we can uh, ask Liz and Natasha their thoughts on it. Um, here we go. So, how do you we're to the stream? We're live. We're good. Okay. Good. So um, I'm going to change pace a little bit now. We've been kind of looking quite um, uh, critically at where we're at right now, but I'm kind of taking it out into a macro level because I'm um, a director for uh, at the British School in the Netherlands uh, with a specialism in professional learning and development for school improvement. And so I'm going to focus on the global profession because I think there are going to be some quite significant changes in the international sector. And so... Um, Let's start with that. So before we can really consider what the implications could potentially be, bearing in mind we're talking pre and post COVID, but I, I think there's gonna be a period of time where we're in the middle of this. Uh, we're gonna start with looking at uh, what was it like beforehand? Some of you will have seen this data from ISC. Um, it's always at the, the big conferences, um, and I love it. I love this stuff. It's just really nerdy, but brilliant. And what I'm interested in here is looking at our staff and our professional capacity. And the reason why that matters is most of the money that we spend as schools is on our staffing. Uh, you're looking 80 90% of your revenue will be spent on uh, staffing in many organizations. So it's the most expensive aspect of your provision. 
And of course, we're in the business of education, uh, whether we like that language or not. And so what we're selling is high quality education. It's a service and it's about people. So our staff are the most important commodity that we have. And not only that, we also know as school leaders, those of you that are interested in kind of the research background around this, that the most impactful area that you can work in as a school leader is enhancing the professional capacity of your staff. So that self-improving system. So if we're looking at the data here in 2019, so last year, there were 535,000 uh, teachers working in the international sector. And then uh, ISC do their market projections, which are usually really accurate. I haven't seen an amended project projection based on the COVID situation we're in. I'd be interested to see whether they're going to revise this data. But what we know is that uh, it's highly likely that we will be crossing the million in terms of the number of teachers that are needed internationally to service the demand of international schools by 2029. Now, that, that's interesting and all marvelous. You think, well, that's doubling in numbers. But what does that really mean? Well, this is what it means. This is how many teachers, a million teachers would look like. I mean, this just happens to be Obama. Um, so I, I was Googling, what does a million look like? I'm a really visual person. It's the primary teacher in me. And so I, I wondered, you know, how, how, what does that really look like? I then did some maths and worked out that the, the number of teachers in the UK, I looked at Ireland, I looked at the States, and I looked at South Africa. Those are the four countries that I looked at. And in those countries, there's about four and a half million teachers. So that means, and these are some of the tra traditional recruiting countries for um, teachers for the English medium international school market. Now that raises all kinds of questions about um, diversity, equity and entitlement, but I'm gonna part those for the moment. But if you're looking at that figure and you're reliant on using this capacity, we're talking one in four teachers from those countries working in the international sector by 2029. I mean, is that possible? Would that happen? Well, the truth is, of course, it wouldn't. And what we're gonna see is an increasing move, and we already know that from the work that Natasha has been doing and the work that we've been doing as well at the British School in the Netherlands and international schools across the world, is an increasing interest in how do we build professional capacity and we use external expertise where we need it, but where we can home grow, it's cheaper and more cater to the market need. And um, we also see that with the growth of international schools, which are no longer servicing uh, expatriate students by expatriate teachers, we're seeing an increasing homogenization. So we're seeing an increase, increasing um, uh, student makeup that is more diverse and increasingly not expatriate. So that, that's an interesting point. So that's where we're up to. And when we started to look, I thought I'd just put this in because I think it's interesting, is when we look at what teachers want, TeachAway published this report um, every year. We've got the 2020 report there, and I think the previous one was 2018. My eyesight's not that great to see it. The top one, I think, was 2018. And we're increasingly seeing internationally that teachers are really interested. They want to get paid fairly, but they're also looking at the, the organizations that will support them professionally. So up to this period of COVID, we've seen increasing schools putting more money and resource, not only because they know that um, looking at the professional capacity of their staff will lead to outstanding schools, but they also know that this is how they attract the, be attract the best. Teachers are not just looking at what the pay is, they're looking at the full package and professional learning opportunities and opportunities to grow are a really important part of that package. I then looked in the 2020 report, you'll see you know, 76% of international schools have had to work harder to recruit teachers. So you see schools like Doha College, um, uh, like the British School of Muscat, like schools like the British School in the Netherlands. Um, so schools that are well respected international schools, and there are many of them in the Middle East that are working in this area, that are increasingly looking to develop in this area and to collaborate with other schools to create little hubs within their communities. And what I think is also interesting is that um, it's naturally balancing out. So, for example, in the Netherlands, we lead on the leadership development for Europe with the largest centre. And yet there are um, other schools in the area that specialise maybe in Project um, Zero with Harvard, and they lead on that side. So we, we're looking at the specialisms that we have, and then we're specialising across our schools. So what we saw before COVID was this ramping up. Uh, international schools having centres for professional learning, you know, you had um, uh, the American schools in London, which aren't the American schools in, anymore, they're called the international schools I discovered in the summer, you know, they have the centre for inquiring minds. And so there's been a real huge energy going into this area. And then COVID hit. Now, of course, when you go into crisis, what you'll focus on is the immediate 
and the long-term development and uh, professional um, enhancement side of things starts to take uh, a back seat for many staff, not all, we had some who actually had less um, uh, work at this time. So we saw with some teaching assistants and support type staff in some areas. And we actually saw, if you look at uh, Educare, they were crossing a million um, registrations every day from staff at home engaging in professional learning. But in truth, professional learning for school improvement, a lot, you know, sustainable school improvement that is making a significant difference over time, that's really come to a halt. And so when we're looking at what is the impact going to be for our global profession, which means all of our schools, you can start to see already some of the feedback around that. So this was a, a survey put out by COBIS, and it was, I think it was around April time to give the date. Oh, there we are, May, May 2020. And here, this is some of the things that they were starting to see um, schools were doing. So reducing spend in other budget areas, reducing spend on CPD. Now, many of us couldn't travel anyway, so any CPD that involved travel was automatically stopped. And we had a lot of move onto online learning, which is an interesting um, move anyway, and perhaps worth considering more. But we could already see uh, quite a significant change, the 32% decrease. If you think that the average school expenditure internationally on professional learning and development is thought to be around 2% of school revenue, that's research coming out from Peggy Polonis, then you know, we're talking quite a significant drop in money. And so that's going to have an impact, not only on access, but those organisations that are providing the support um, to, and services for um, school-specific uh, professional learning. Not only that, um, this is the ISC view. I know it's really small, but I, I just put it, I thought it was easier to copy and paste it in. So it says, where do you think international schools will invest most heavily in products? And what they said at this time is investing in technology platforms and apps, which we all know, virtual learning solutions, yes, <laughs> obviously, digital assessment tools, management information systems, well-being apps, which is what Natasha had brought up earlier, online training, yes, we've been, we've moved many of our programs um, online to our online platform, thank goodness we invested in that last year, um, and more. It also says schools need this and parents will expect it. Most parents viewing international schools for future admissions will include education continuity plans and resources as a priority consideration in their selection. Mm -hmm. So parents are going to be more critical about how a school spends its money and why. Now, from a professional learning perspective, I know that it's critical for the long term, but for the short term, it's a very hard sell when your student numbers are potentially falling. Not only that, this is what I picked up. I just did a quick... Um, uh, Oh, this is marvellous. Any moment now it's going to show personal stories. Fab. So I'm on my LinkedIn page. I just thought I'll get a few um, images of the thing that popped up on my LinkedIn. So um, uh, this was Jason in Thailand. I have never seen this before. A school letting, letting everyone know that they're letting staff go and then trying to get them into other schools. I mean, good on him for um, committing to his staff in this way. But doesn't that show a changing climate? It's a bit scary, really. Then about this, we then see um, uh, Mark Brooks is saying, you know, that we're seeing some schools are now seeing this, they're seeing an upturn. So we've now got a real tension between some of our international schools that are very concerned about student numbers and enrollment to others that are seeing this as a great opportunity um, and their numbers increasing. Be interesting if it's true, I don't know if it is or not. And then we see this, is we start to see the reopening, which we've been, we're all at slightly different stages with that, but that is what is consuming all of us. And so when we're looking at professional learning and development, quite frankly, is whilst it's still there, and I think it's very important, it's very difficult to um, really make sure that we continue to put energy into that. Um, this has just been published and you can read it yourself. And this was published just before COVID, uh, the uh, crisis hit. So again, I think it would be interesting to see if they were to do that um, again, what that data would now find. And so this is what I think. I think the new normal is going to mean that we start to see globalised education from the idea of international education and that we'll start to see the profession as a global profession as opposed to an international school uh, population. These are my heady predictions. I could be terribly wrong, so nobody take any pictures of it in case it's terrible. Um, so I think what we're going to see is decreased CPD spend in the short term. I think there's no doubt about that. There are very few schools that at a time of crisis will want to be seen as being uh, extravagant with money, whether it's actually extravagant or not is another question. Uh, I think we're going to see increased online access and collaboration with, with and between schools. And we've started to see that in our own networks as well, where because we're already collaborating together, this crisis has brought us closer together with our local international schools as well as from other countries. 
I think over time, we're going to be more concerned about retention. And so we're going to see more resource and packages that are biased towards that. So when we get our staff, we keep them for as long as we possibly can. If that makes sense. And then, of course, this was an area that was already in development and it was already happening internationally. But I think with the, um, the movements, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter and looking at equity, looking at the COVID situation, looking at globalization, I think there's going to be more and more uh, interest and concern in making sure that our staff populations represent the communities that they serve. And so I think we're going to see less expats over time. Uh, there's a financial aspect to that, but there's also an equity issue. And then that brings me on to the last point. I think we're going to see increased representation of non-native English speaking teachers in faculty over time in the so-called premium international schools, the ones that generally I frequent <laughs> or consider to be premium. Um, I think that's really hard because we've got parental expectation here. Uh, but I think we've got a duty of care to move that on. And that's it. Okay, so Great nuggets of information there and a few things that I'm really keen to, to go away and read. Um, obviously, after the show, um, if you could share those uh, bits of research with us, Liz, on, on Twitter, yeah. and then we can include them in the show notes um, as well. Just sort of looking at that in, in terms of, um, I guess, moving a lot of things online, um, I, I, I sort of... Are we actually facing uh, through rapid digitization? Are we, are we in the midst of an industrial revolution or the, the fourth revolution within education or not? Well, I think we're going to face um, yes, in a way. I think we're already, we were already in it anyway, um, but I think we're further into it. And I'm also really interested in British international education is at this time where we've had um, prolonged homeschooling, what the parental response has been to that. And when we're looking particularly at secondary education, you've got companies like Way Education, Harrow, um, with their online school that are offering A-levels, IGCSEs, all delivered completely remotely all around the world. And, you know, what, what change is that going to make? Uh, I think we're going to see increased growth in that, those, that type of provision. And so as international schools, we've got to be really clear about what our USPs are and why our kind of settings will develop the whole child where in a way that online learning can't currently. It's, it has a, an amazing potential, but we still need human interaction. You know, we still need to the informal conversations down a corridor. Uh, you know, all those the, the little things that you notice about some, how somebody is. And so I think the human aspect um, is what I've learned anyway, is the human connection and the humanity that we have in the work that we do. We are professionals in working with people. And so I think there's a real tension there between the capacity of online provision and the humanity of education. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great response there. And I think you know, if we think about our kind of guiding principle behind getting into education, it's it's that human element, isn't it? And I think that's what comes back at the forefront for most of us. And it's the yearning of teachers to get back in the classroom. And Ollie's cutting out. <laughs> Please go on. Yeah, he's gone. We'll wait till he gets back. But um, Liz, I'd say the same thing. I completely agree with you. And if I, you know that that they are some of the things that a lot of the parents are saying are is, oh, you know, well, I can just homeschool my children. It's okay. And it's like, yeah, it's been okay because we've been provided everything for you. Actually, okay. um, it will be a very different thing if you have to um, if you have to provide that for yourself. And and I do think if if I was predicting anything that we will have quite a few. Um, parents that will say, well, do you know what, I'm going to homeschool from August to September, and, and, and I think we will, but I do think then there'll be a very quick drop off once schools start opening properly and everything, getting back to normality, you'll start seeing children, parents going, actually, no, because it is that connection, it's all of that social aspect that they're not going to be able to get that they need, desperately need. Um, I suppose what would concern me is you're going to have a lot of pop up online schools opening with goodness knows who behind a screen trying to teach children that would be my concern as well and where, where's the um uh the quality assurance and in terms of the uk certification anyone can set up um because you don't have to be a licensed center to set up because you right. have the examinations themselves obviously set in a licensed center so there is uh there are no controls 
over the quality of that provision. And, and so I think, uh, again, this comes down to schools really telling their story, which is, I think, what um, we've been, what I've seen both in terms of the British School in the Netherlands and the International School Rheintal, where I'll be heading out to shortly, is that really explaining what you're doing and why, even at that pace, when you're making decisions quickly in ways that perhaps you haven't before, but then coming back in, we're doing this because of this re research and we know that this works for students. This is what it takes to get there. So not to sugarcoat it um, in terms of the level of uh, engagement, professional engagement that we have to get to, like you said, a three minute video. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. that uh, and yeah. so I think we need to be brave in telling the story about that's how much we care about our communities. And that also means that sometimes we'll do things and maybe not get it right. There will be some yeah. things that work better than other things. Uh, so I think this is a real time for the international school market, actually all schools, to shine and to really show the value of what they bring to their communities and what our students, some of our students are now missing and why the work that we do right across the world is so important for future generations. Yeah, absolutely. I think that showcasing is, is so important. Um, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. And having that communication with parents, I think that might be one of the areas that we do need to look at and say, well, actually, we know you send your children to our school because you think we're great, but actually look at what we're doing and look at what we're offering. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. There's some great points there. Um, to draw on um, something in your presentation then, Liz, um, and Natasha, please feel free to, to chip in on this. Um, you talk really passionately, and I, lo I love listening to you talk about that, that global profession. How do we use our current kind of context and situation to innovate and move to that that holistic scale mm. approach um, that that we all know we probably need to actually get to? We do this. Mm. <laughs> This is a really good example of we're just, I mean, we have got quite a lot to do, to be fair, but we are kind of all hanging out around our homes. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, this is an amazing opportunity to bring us together. You know, what did this take? This took a couple of um, uh, Twitter messages saying, could you, would you? And what I found actually globally, whether we're looking at the women ed movement, looking at chartered college, in our profession, our profession is incredibly generous. And so yeah. when somebody asks, you know, can you talk to me about this? Or, you know, what have you learned about that? Will you join us with a conversation like this? I think that's where we can take ownership at a, ground, a grassroots level, uh, take ownership for our own learning, but also in building our professional networks so that we can learn and share from each other. Uh, and I think technology is a really um, a freeing way, not free as in Liz free, but <laughs> um, you know, really uh, accessible way for all of us to do this. Like I said, what did it take to have this conversation? Um, and I always feel enriched whenever I do, we do anything like this. I always come away with new ideas or think I want to talk to that person more about that because that's going to enhance the work that I can do with my students. So I think that's that's the easiest thing we can do is we, we've got a kind of a two pronged attack is that we've got the global work that we do with organizations like Hobis, um, uh, well, whoever they might be, lots of different organizations, ECIS, the American Schools Group. Yep, the SME. Exactly. So you use those as well, and you can um, start to lobby and start to have influence at national and international levels. And then you just build your own professional network. And when I first went international in 2006, I had my first uh, international headship in 2006. I mean, we didn't even have like iPhones, <laughs> which my kids were just blown away by. They were like, what? Like, what? <laughs> my iPod the other day, they were like, what is this? How does it work? They couldn't understand that it had to go round. They're like, don't you just, you know, swipe. <laughs> so. But, you know, in, working internationally back in the 2000s, which that wasn't that, I'm not that old, so it wasn't that long ago. But even then, I think we didn't have this ability. The only way I'd be able to connect with international colleagues was by going to international conferences. And that's for the few, even now, you know, even though we're mostly, not right now, but generally very well funded for professional learning. Not everyone in your staff can go to the COBUS Leadership Conference or your local um, conferences. And so I think the um, explosion of things like Twitter, um, LinkedIn increasingly, the Chartered College, is creating these hubs, whether they're hubs by specialist areas like tech, ed tech, or whether it's hubs in geographical areas like uh, Women Ed Mina. You know, you can 
you can now use technology as the vehicle to access and to network in a way that, like I said, you wouldn't have done 10 years ago. That's exactly what I was talking about in terms of the positives and what we're getting from this. Yeah. I mean, I, every time, just like Liz said, every time I have these conversations, every one I watch, I get something from. And actually, in terms of those networking opportunities and having those, these, I mean, I've only been international six years. And even when I came internationally, I just felt so isolated, like there was nothing there for me to grip at or to continue to have these professional conversations. And I mean, look, it's what, nine o'clock in the evening, and I am able to have this conversation, and I will come off of this conversation feeling buzzing. Forget about everybody else that's most really at home watching this and going, yeah, yeah, at the screen. You know? <laughs> um, and so I think that just as much as it's been a really rubbish, horrible time, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have got so many positives out of this situation. Um, and and I think from a from a professional development perspective, you know, Liz and I have, have luckily been able to connect and have and have lots and lots of conversations about um, what there are out, what things that there are out there, and from a professional perspective, share ideas and things. And actually, um, you know, we we have done lots of stuff online. There's lots of stuff I've done with Tess online, even prior to, prior uh, pre uh, COVID, etc. And, and actually. Now it just shows actually all of that work that was going into that, just like Liz had said, all of that, all of that stuff actually, we're, we're, we're so lucky because we have people that predict these things in education because we're constantly thinking and talking and having these conversations. Um, and actually it, it's shown that actually it's necessary, it, it saves schools money, it gives everybody an opportunity and it's about equality and fairness as well when it comes to those CPD budgets in school. Um, and, and actually these normal conversations because lots of people used to see um, CPD opportunities online as just me looking at a PowerPoint slide, flicking through it, getting a certificate at the end. This creates the element that was missing, which was that face-to-face -face and having those conversations. This gives us that. Um, and this is the bit that people felt that they were missing. And the lack of cost of this is huge. Um, and, and you still get almost as much out of it as, as you would have so you know yeah, they're amazing positive. um michael fullens you know one of uh oh. the thing that mark mark shares quite regularly and, and always resonated me was a, is a quote from michael fullen that pedagogy is the driver and technology is the accelerator and i feel like we're we're in a position now where our professional learning network is is the driver by being able to access all of these different groups and technology accelerates that because it enables access to all of these different channels and it, and it enables us to kind of take ownership of, of efficacy in our in our own way and actually tap into all of the different resources that are out there um, you know through various groups um, like COBIS or Women Ed Mina um, you know different networks so that we can really just grow both personally on a micro scale and then at scale within our schools and then um, drive capacity on a, on a larger scale. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but I've got one question um, that I'd like to, to add in. Um, it comes from uh, Gani Yu. Um, it says, hi, Liz. Do you think international schools might start recruiting teachers to teach synchronously from their home country? Oh, interesting question. Um, I, felt, I felt like I was doing a Blue Peter thing there when I did that. <laughs> Um, what do, uh, I mean, let me think about what that means. Uh, so, do I think? Yes, I do think that will happen, and I, it's been on the agenda for a long time. We've all been talking about it and kind of um, walking around the edges of this. Is you know why is it that we, the majority of uh, international school teachers, uh, are not from the countries that they're working in? So, what is that about, really? And then we have this whole conversation around native. English speakers on the value of native English speakers. And I read on a, a LinkedIn post from a, a head teacher in, I think it was Thailand um, uh, earlier in the week that said, if you've ever seen reports from some of our native English speaking teachers, you might want to start questioning some of um, this <laughs> around that. And it made me laugh. Actually, took me back. I just, I, you know, as a head teacher, you obviously have to you read. Most head teachers read every report, which is what I would do. Uh, and I remember that there's one or two teachers that you know that you might have to read slightly more carefully than others. So I, I think we've got to be asking ourselves, it's the right time now. You know, we're, international schools are here for the long haul. We have an issue with the, um, the numbers of teachers that we need and the supply of teachers. We know that. 
And so we've got to think differently. And it's a shame in a way that we couldn't have thought differently without it being the financial driver, but it's it's a truth. And so I do think the, it's a very long answer to your question, but I think we will get there, but I think it will be slow. And I think we've got to show the value of well-trained, um, uh, pedagogy-rich, student-centered teachers in international curricula and the strength of that and how, you know, the idea you can't be what you can't see, what does that say to our communities when we're all shouting about the fact we've got 90 nationalities in our schools, you know, what makeup of our teachers. And so I think I think we've got to be having these difficult, uh, as a British teacher, white, British white teacher myself, um, I think we've got to be having some of these really difficult conversations and then we've got to be ready to walk the walk. And I say that going into an international school where I'm about to be a CEO. So what <laughs> Thanks. But you know what, Liz, it's so like refreshing to hear that from a non-white um, leader going into schools because you know it, it is the conversation that everyone is having at the moment, and 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 I suppose from my community have been having it for a very very long time, and it is sad that it's happened. It started to have to happen now, um, but also the makeup of schools is very different to what it was 15 years ago in terms of what we look at in, a, in an expat school, that, that whole idea of, oh, we need a, a British trained, native English speaking um, member of staff coming in. Well, actually the nature of, of the children that are in our school is very different. We now have, uh, you know, very different children coming into school, a mixture of ethnicities, like we are all there, you know, shouting and screaming about, um, and there needs to be representation for those children. Those children need to see people that look like them in school. Yeah, yeah. We agree. Now is a great chance to break the glass ceiling and actually Absolutely. really reassess and do things completely different from Absolutely. how we train each other, how we connect, who we represent, yeah. um, and and basically what what we want schools to look like moving forwards. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We've run a little bit over, but the conversation was really rich and I didn't want to stop. So. <laughs> Um, I think that brings us to a natural close. I'd just like to say a massive thank you to both Natasha and to Liz. Um, mm -hmm. If you'd like to reach out to them, please just check uh, both of their Twitter handles and um, obviously all their information is on the YouTube channel as well. Um, massive thanks from me to both of you. Um, looking ahead then to next week, uh, next week our show is all about managing your online reputation. So really, really looking forward to um, welcoming our guests for that particular show, the, the last one before the summer holidays. But a final thank you from me to both Natasha and Liz. It's been oh, a fantastic. Thank you, Ollie. Honestly, thank you for inviting me. It was amazing. You're more than welcome. So we'll say bye bye and we'll continue. <laughs> Thanks, bye. everybody. Bye.